Hello, welcome to chapter nine, inflation, treasury securities, and treasury market. So as usual, you know what's next, let's jump right in. Okay, we can start looking at treasury securities and why they're so important and how they're used in finance, okay? So let's do an overview on this, okay? The US Treasury Department issues treasury securities. These are debt securities, okay? And they're put into two big buckets. If they're short term, in other words, the contract is going to end in less than a year. They're going to mature in less than a year. They're called notes, okay? And if they're longer term, that's defined to be a year or greater out to right now 30 years, um, they're called bonds, okay? So notes are just, as far as Treasury is concerned, short-term bonds. Contracts are exactly the same, just have a shorter maturity. Collectively, the notes and the bonds are called treasuries. So when people are talking about treasuries, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about treasury debt, either notes or bonds, okay? So why would the treasury issue these securities? Well, it needs cash, right? Just like any other borrower, right? It's doing this uh, to get cash, okay? And why does it need cash? It needs cash because the federal government's expenditures are greater than tax revenue. And when this happens, we say that the treasuries issue these bonds because it needs to fill the deficit hole. The deficit is the expenditures of the government in a given year minus the taxes. Okay, so that's what that's what the deficit is about. That's why the Treasury has to issue bonds or notes. Okay, so let's just put the Treasury market in context a little bit. Um, there's 11 billion in outstanding, uh, 11 trillion rather, in outstanding Treasury debt. Um, I have no idea what that means. That's way too big a number. So how can I put this into terms I can understand? Well, how about the worldwide global bond market is 80 trillion. So it's about an eighth of the size of the total worldwide bond market. So that's pretty big, right? Um, another way to think about it, which is very helpful, is that it represents 60% of the annual US GDP. So that means if we wanted to pay down all of our treasury debt in one year, we'd have to take 60% of GDP and devote that all to paying down that debt, okay? So just by the by, uh, if they wanted to do the same thing in Japan, they would have to take 1.8 years worth of entire GDP to pay down their sovereign debt in Japan. That's bad, especially because their demographics are bad, their population is shrinking. Okay, but that's a story for another day, probably another class. How else can we think about the treasury market? Um, there in 2018, about 1.1 trillion bonds and notes were issued. And that was, of course, about the size of the federal deficit. So federal expenditures were $1.1 trillion more than tax revenue that came in in 2018. That's probably not so good. Okay. And another way we can think about this is to look at trading volumes. Um, and for the treasuries, about 800 billion uh, trades per day. And if we look at the entire U.S. stock market, it's only about a tenth of that. Okay. So there's a lot of trading in treasuries. And treasuries, you can trade 24-7, 365 days a year. So for all these reasons, the Treasury market is considered the most liquid and transparent market essentially in the world. That's going to be important as we go on. All right, so what are our characteristics of Treasury securities? This is review because we've covered this. This is at least the fourth time we've covered this now, right? These are all essentially bonds, right? So they're going to be happening in a contractual framework, okay? And what it means for the treasury, for example, is they issue a bond, they're gonna get 100 million now, they're gonna pay rent on that of say, for example, 10 million every year for three years. This is a very simplified example, of course. And then they're gonna pay back that 100 million at the end of three years. And as we know, like all 
bond contracts, treasury bonds and notes, okay, are transferable contracts. So they can be bought and sold after issuance in secondary markets. And the price that they're bought and sold at after issuance in secondary markets has nothing to do with the contract, right? The treasury has to pay whoever is holding the bond per the initial contract terms, just like any other bond we've talked about since the first day of class. Okay, so second important characteristic of treasuries is their risk. So treasuries are considered by everyone in finance and economics as virtually risk-free. And I have that in quotes. Why do I have that in quotes? Because what people mean by risk-free when they're talking about risk-free treasuries is they mean there's virtually no probability that the U.S. Treasury Department will default. Okay, that the U.S. government is not going to be able to cough up the cash needed to repay those bonds and notes. So other ways to think about this are investors are definitely, almost definitely, going to be paid back in full and on time. And this implies that investors buy treasuries when they're worried about the failure of other investments, like right now, sitting here March 11th in 2020, um, when folks are very worried about the economic impact of the coronavirus um, and the brilliant move uh, by the Saudis and the Russians to get into a fight leading the Saudis to flood the world oil market with oil at a time when the global economy is moving into recession and demand is very low already. Um, so when this, when this happens, when bad things are happening macroeconomically, um, folks around the world put a lot of their money into treasuries because they're considered so safe. Um, and that's called, when that happens, a flight to quality or a flight to treasuries. And that happens very strongly in market panics. Okay, and for all these reasons, um, this helps the US dollar, which of course is closely tied to treasuries, be considered the world's primary reserve currencies. If you're freaked out about what's happening um, and you are in, for example, Malaysia, you want to buy US treasuries, so what do you have to do? You have to buy dollars um, because treasuries are only sold in dollars. Okay, so this all does not mean that treasuries are riskless. It does mean the risk of the US Treasury Department flaming out is very low, okay? But it does not mean there are no risks with buying treasuries. So let's look at what some of the risks are of buying treasury bonds or notes. There's one class of risks that is shared with any investment in the whole wide world, and that's called duration risk. Duration risk is simply the risk that we're going to have a bad outcome. And that risk, of course, increases with the length of the project. Because the farther we're looking into the future, the harder it is to say with certainty nothing bad is going to happen. And so here's my favorite illustration of that. Um, this is a graph put together by the federal government um, right around the beginning of 2009. We're coming out of the Great Recession. Um, and these were predictions of GDP going forward. So the dark blue line here is their expected value prediction. And all of the lighter lines around it represent one standard deviation above or below their predictions. And what you can see here is the farther you go out into the future, the less certain the US government was of its estimates for GDP. And this is true for any investment. The farther you go into the future, the less certain you are, the more risky that investment becomes. Okay, that's true of at treasuries, that's true of any project, any investment in finance. Okay, so that's risk for any investment. So the second big bucket of risks for treasuries are treasury specific. And these are threefold, inflation risk, interest rate risk, and that default risk that we already talked about, the chance that the Treasury Department won't repay you, okay? And so all of these risks, duration risk, which was in A, 
and these three in B, they're not independent, okay? Clearly, inflation risk is going to be tied to interest rate risk, and all of these risk duration, inflation, interest rate are going to be tied to the probability of the U.S. government defaulting on its treasuries, okay? So with all this in mind, we're going to call with everyone else in finance and economics, we'll say, okay, yeah, whatever, we'll agree with you. We'll call treasuries risk-free securities, but we will remember as everyone else does in finance and economics, that there are these risks, okay? These four risks, duration, inflation, interest rate, and default, okay? And we'll also say, that our treasury interest rates or discount rates are gonna be called risk-free rates. And we're going to write them in equations as R sub risk-free or RRF. So that's how we'll be treating these going forward. So let's do an example illustrating treasury bond risk. Very simple, straightforward example. So let's say, excuse me, <coughs> You're considering buying a 10-year zero-coupon treasury bond at issuance, uh, given a few things. The face value, remember the face value is what is going to be paid back at maturity. Uh, that's 100 so we have $100 face value, par value, principal value bonds here. The inflation rate today is 2%, and remember we write that in equations as R sub INF. And right now, investors are sort of medium scared of riskier stock investments. Remember, the more scared they are of stock investments, the more they're going to put money into treasuries. And today, investors are demanding a risk-free interest rate for this bond of 8%. Okay, so how did they get to that 8%? Treasury bonds are sold at auction. And so what will happen is the biggest 20 bank, the biggest 20 banks in the world are allowed um, to into these auctions. And someone like JP Morgan Chase will say, well, I'd be willing to buy this 10 year bond with an interest rate of 9%. And Wells Fargo is going to say, well, I'd be willing to buy it for just 8%. So Wells Fargo wins that option and the rate would be set at 8%. So what is that 8% comprised of? Well, clearly 2% inflation is part of that. And Wells Fargo says, I want an additional 6% over that for other stuff. What's that other stuff? That additional 6% accounts for everything but inflation, interest rate risk, default risk, and duration risk. So that's where that total 8% comes from. 2% from inflation, okay? And the other 6% from the rest of the treasury risk, right? So these are the remaining treasury risks. Okay, so with this in mind, we can, using everything that we have learned in time value of money, we can figure out the price paid for each bond, right? So what can we do? We can use that fundamental present value, future value formula. The present value is going to be the price paid, and that's equal to the future value divided by 1 plus R raised to the, what do we have, 10 years here, I believe it's a 10-year bond, yep, yeah, okay, and that's equal to, so the face value is what we get back, that's the future value, okay, and this is 1 plus 8% raised to the 10, okay, and if you work that out, again, you should check me, um, but when I work that out, I get 46.3. Right. Always, always, always check these. Do this before you try the homework, anything like that. It'll make doing the homework much quicker. It'll make your exam studying much better, and it will make you get a higher score on the exam. Okay, so make sure you understand how I did that, and it all should make sense to you. By the way, these were very important. Forgot to mention up here before. Oh, no. Um, these are zero coupon bonds. So zero coupon bonds are just of this form right where um, you pay something for the bond today and 
you don't get anything, you don't get anything, you don't get anything, and then in the future, you get that. So this is a zero coupon bond. It's just a two cash flow bond. So now we're thinking about the risk of treasuries. Okay, so we were on the board of Wells Fargo. We approved this 8%. We won the treasury auction. So we got this. And what happens if the next day we need some cash at Wells Fargo? So we decide to sell this bond. And let's consider two scenarios. In case one, inflation expectations overnight have riven, risen to 6% nothing else has changed. This type of inflation shock definitely has happened. It definitely will happen again in the future. Classic example of this uh, is in the 1970s when OPEC overnight raised the price of oil by about 50%, and that led everyone to change their inflation expectations because oil is such a big component in the CPI. So that has happened in the past. It will happen again. It can happen overnight just like this, okay? So if nothing else has changed, so investors did demand 2% plus 6%. So today, nothing else has changed except inflation has shot from 2% to 6%. Okay, so now they're going to demand an RRF of what? Of 6%, okay, for inflation plus 6% other equals 12%, okay? So that's just right on the uh, um, overnight that's changed. So now we're, we sell the bond. So what's the price going to be paid? It's going to be 100, that future value, divided by one plus 12%, okay? Raised to the 10. And let me just copy that over into Excel. And that's 32.2, okay? So overnight, we paid for this bond 46.3. So we're going to lose 46.3 minus 32.2. And that's not good. That's equal to, can I do this one in my head? Yes, I can. 14.1 per bond. Not so good. So this is a very realistic scenario. You buy a bond, you have to sell it soon. Inflation expectations have changed. That's moved the price of the bond and you come up a big loser. Okay, so definitely you want to understand this for homework and for exam two. Okay, so here's another case. So we bought that bond yesterday at 46.3. So overnight, world peace is declared. Okay, awesome. So what's going to happen if world peace is declared? Anybody want to going to want to invest in these paltry treasury bonds that don't pay very much? No, right? We're going to go. If there's not much risk in the world, what's going to happen? People are going to move their investments from treasuries to stocks. So if they do that, what's going to happen to demand for treasuries? It's going to go down. What's going to happen? We know from economics, if demand goes down, the price is going to go down. So you could, again, lose $14 per bond. So if things go very bad in the world or if things go very well in the world, you could lose a lot of money on this. So treasuries, the takeaway, purchasing treasuries is not a risk-free project. Okay. Okay, now let's look at what's called the treasury yield curve. Um, and let's start this out by reminding ourselves, in general, all of our projects have duration risk, right? That's the risk that says the longer the 
project, the riskier it gets. Okay, so what this means for treasury bonds is the longer time we have till maturity, the increased possibility we're going to have of something bad happening, like we saw and inflation expectations could change. There could be a big change in interest rates. So there could be a big change in investors' views of the treasury defaulting, and that would cause problems for our investment too. So because we have all these risks that happen as our duration increases, we should expect that investors demand higher yields for longer dated treasuries, right? That that's just that's just common sense. And if we look in the marketplace, that is found out to be true empirically. And we can see that in what's called the term structure of treasury interest rates. And a graphic representation of the term structure is called the treasury yield curve. And that's what we're going to focus on. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here we've got a couple of treasury yield curves. How do these work? On the x-axis, we have time, OK? And on the y-axis, we have YTM. Remember, YTM we just learned is EA. IR in bondland, EAIR is the same thing as YTM for a bond, right? It's the compound annual interest that we're going to get on this. So I've got two curves here from time one and time two. And really what I want to show you here is how these were constructed. The way they were constructed is I went out to Bloomberg and I found what was the YTM for a one-year treasury bond and I plotted that and then I went out to Bloomberg and I found what was the YTM or the EAIR for a two-year bond and these are all zero coupon zero coupon bonds um, and I went out and I did the same thing for a three-year bond and then a five-year bond and then a 10-year bond and then finally up here, a 30-year bond. And then literally all I did was draw a line between these points that I had plotted. And that's your yield curve. So what does this yield curve show? It shows that if I'm an investor, the marketplace says the market yield for a one-year treasury is just over 2%. But if I want to go out for two years, more time for bad things to happen, more duration risk. So I should expect a higher interest rate. And in fact, that's true. I can get a higher interest rate. I can get almost 4% for a two-year treasury. If I want to invest in a longer treasury, more duration risk, more time for things to go bad. So I should get a higher interest rate. I do. I get about 5% and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really just a graphic representation of duration risk for treasury bonds. So let's see how I've described this here. So we have an increasing interest rate for treasuries with increasing time to maturity, increased RRF, EAIR, YTM, with increasing time to maturity for the treasuries. Okay. And the other thing I'd like you to note here is that the curve does change in time. Again, I've done this for two times. Here's time uh, T1, and here is time T2 in these two different colors. And the reason the curve changes in time is because people's risks uh, view on the riskiness of the world and treasuries changes over time. Sometimes people feel more worried about near term than long term. So that's going to bring the near term part of this curve up here and not so much change the long term part of the curve. So we might get something like that and still ending up up here with these guys and things like that happen. So it's a live curve. It does change over time. OK, so those are all the, the key basics of treasuries. So let's let's review them um, because we're going to be using treasuries and a lot of models for the rest of the semester. So what are the key characteristics we've looked at? They're universally considered to be the safest investments in the world. OK. It's not always true, but it's good approximation. Their risks are relatively few and well understood. What are those risks? Duration, 
and you need to know these risks. You just got to memorize the risks of treasuries. So there's four risks for treasuries duration. And if I could type, I could get us the other three um, inflation rates, interest rates, and we've got the default. And default is very small. So they're well known, relatively well understood. Second key point is treasury market. One of the biggest, most liquid, transparent markets in the whole wide world. Okay. And for these reasons, treasuries are going to be a foundational part of most of our risk models going forward. So what are our beautiful risk models going to include here? Okay. So I've got here a summary of risks we're going to have to think about for our investments going forward. Um, another way to say that is what's going to be included in our risk models. Okay, so, so far, what have we looked at? We've looked at duration risk. That's going to be featured in any financial project that we do. And what's it include? It's just the increased probability of bad stuff happening the longer out into the future we're looking. And the other thing we've looked at here in this chapter are the risk-free risks with treasuries, which are we've got duration already so i need three more so we've got inflation interest rate okay and default right okay don't forget duration for treasuries right because duration is for anything so that gives us a total of four for treasuries okay so these are the ones that we covered in this chapter okay and what's coming up in the next chapter are going to be these risks. Industry or market risks, that's gonna be for anything that's not a treasury and a project specific risk is gonna be for all non-diversified projects. Okay, so these are, let's make those double stars. Okay, so that's gonna be coming up in the next chapter. Let's make these both double stars here. Okay, and that does it. So I'm going to sign out now and look forward uh, to seeing you all again soon. Hi, here's just a quick addendum to our handout number nine on inflation and treasuries. Um, I thought I'd show you something pretty interesting um, from current market conditions. What I've got over here on the left is a graph of the yield, uh, the YTM, um, on U.S. Treasury 10-year bonds. Um, so these are bonds that you would buy and hold for 10 years uh, and then get your principal back and get interest along the way and all that jazz. Um, and going all the way back to the 1950s to where we are now, you see that the yield has never been lower um, even during the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, yields did not drop uh, below or even anything near uh, where they are right now. And as I pointed out in lecture nine, um, the one of the reasons that yields go down is that people in times of crisis want to invest in the safest thing that they can. And that's something like a treasury, U.S. Treasury bond. Um, and that drives uh, the demand up. It drives the prices up. And as the prices go up, the yields are inversely proportional to that. So the yields go down. So this is a very, very interesting. Uh, right now, this phenomenon is due to the coronavirus um, and also the uh, flooding of the market uh, with oil uh, by the Saudis. Okay, that's it for this uh, real world addendum.